Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Molly Pepper, the Associate Dean here in the School of Business. And Dean Anderson normally kicks off these sessions, but he's allowing me to uh, take the wheel today. He is here and will be available for questions after our uh, speaker and our Q&A. So just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. I want to remind everyone that we are recording and we will make this uh, recording available through our YouTube channel to those who cannot be here. And thanks for being here. I see a few more people are coming in, so I'm pausing a little bit. We always begin with a little bit of reflection time. So I would just like to encourage you to reflect for a moment on this, our final week of the semester on the GU community, on the students, the staff, the faculty, the parents, the alums, and just the community that we are and the support that we give to each other. So just a moment of reflection. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Antoinella is joining us from Paris, where she is a brain-based brain leadership coach. Uh, it's a little after nine o'clock there, but she's the class of 1996 and double majored in business and psychology. And she's gonna tell us a lot more about that. So I will hand it over to you, Antonella. Thank you for being here. Thank you as well. Um, let's see. I'm going to share with you. Let me know. Molly, do you see my screen? Yes. Thank you for having me here. I'm so honored. Yes, I was a graduate student from 1996. I uh, showing you here a little picture of me um, and some of my fellow colleagues um, or students um, from the class of 96. Um, we were Setons and Knights back in the day. So this is us in front of the admin building. Um, I will present my career background towards the end, but I thought we would go straight into the meat of the subject today, which is giving you just a little bit of tips on how to deal with uncertain times, how to provide some certainty. So again, as Molly had mentioned, I'm a brain-based leadership coach. So I work with teams and individuals to help um, people reach their full potential, to understand um, this interesting um, tool that we have, which is our brain. We understand how to use computers. We understand how to use our smartphones, um, technology, but um, just some little interesting Maybe some of the psychology students on the call actually know. So I thought it might be helpful, especially during this time, during finals week, and during the strange um, COVID-19 time that we are dealing with. So before we start, I'm gonna start with a little um, exercise. It's a little bit like the reflection that Molly just um, went forward with. Um, it's an exercise in neuroscience that helps dampen the, the brain's response to stress and it enables us to focus. So you can do this now together or um, you could just learn about it and then decide to do it maybe before your exam or before you have um, your next presentation or a project that you need to focus on. So first thing is you want to just scan your body. You can close your eyes if you want. Take a few deep breaths and try to succinctly label any sort of emotion you're experiencing. Again, this may sound kind of strange or maybe seem very um, um, foreign to you to do this, but um, it'll really help you focus and be aware of your emotions. So um, perhaps you're feeling a little anxious because um, finals are coming up or 
maybe you had a busy morning or maybe you're just feeling really happy today whatever that is just take time to identify don't go into any sort of big story once you identify whatever emotion it is um, you can visualize setting that emotion aside Even if it's a good one, you want to set it aside. And if it's something not so good, visualize maybe throwing it out. And you can use any other metaphor that resonates with you. So that's my first tip. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit how our brains operate during times of stress. Just a high level overview. Again, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, but um, in my coaching studies, I did study neuroscience, and um, these are the tips that I've learned. So hopefully they can help you. So first of all, um, we have in our brain, um, the most primitive part of our brain is this limbic system, and it's constantly searching for threat. And it's so protective to, it wants to protect you. So Anything that can look like a threat, um, it's going to react. And it, the bad is actually stronger than good for you, for, for this part of the limbic system. So back in the day, you know, um, this was really helpful because uh, maybe lions, tigers, and bears were chasing us. But for everyday social reaction, it's not necessarily helpful. Um, and it can be a habitual, um, loop that we go through. Like, let's say we have an exam, you know, this is a, a week where you, there's a lot of um, deadlines, but if we let that um, stress overtake us, um, it impedes us from actually focusing and performing to our maximum. We'll go over that shortly. So, um, brain based coaching, we um, get the person to go towards the reward, even though um, we are very um, wired to actually go towards the threat, we need to work towards going more towards the reward. So subconsciously, we're, we're going towards the threat. Consciously, we want to counter that. If you have any questions, you can put that in the chat box and then we can cover them at the end of the session. So right now, um, and in general, there are three levels of threat in the brain. So level one is in the broader environment. So let's just use, we were aware that it was a threat, um, but maybe it wasn't in our, um, in, in Washington state, it wasn't in Paris yet, but it was there. Level two is when a threat is maybe in your area. So when I speak of threat, it could be like something um, that's physical, but it could also just be something um, um, psychological, which we can talk about a little social, social threat. Um, so level two, for example, of COVID um, could be like that it was, that it's actually in the state. And level three is when you actually have to deal with something that's upon you. So you can kind of think of that with your brain, how it's trying to deal and kind of organize that. Um, when you let stress take over too much, um, it, it, it impedes the prefrontal cortex, which is the working, um, the part of the brain, it's only 5% of your brain, but it's so important for high level thinking, decision making, dealing with ambiguity, um, it's the part that's actually going to help you um, really have achieve and actually think, think properly and clearly. But when you let the limbic system take over, it's going to take over all of the glucose. As we are all very well-educated Gonzaga um, students or alumni or faculty, um, it's good to understand how to um, prevent this. So David Rock, um, who is a leader in, um, in coaching and neuroscience, 
he came across um, five critical domains that activate that limbic system in a social way. And he calls this the SCARF model. For today, we're going to talk about certainty. So um, how certainty affects our stress or the lack thereof. So the definition of certainty is the ability to predict your environment. Today, as you know, you don't need me to tell you, but just to, to review why we would talk about certainty is that there's certainty at risk, of course. Um, we're aware of that in our, in our environment, but also just among us as well. So a question for you to reflect upon, you could put it in the chat box or you could just keep it for yourself, is how are you creating your own certainty during this time? I'll give you a few tips as promised. So number one, we just talked about the little clearing in the space exercise. That's to bring certainty in your mind, being aware of what your emotions are. So that's number one. Number two, really depending on everyone's situation, but let's say for a student or for faculty, um, it could be trying to create certainty for your workspace. So the first thing that I do is clearing, you clear your mind space, but then you clean your, clear your physical space. Make sure you have, um, you're comfortable, you have your tea, and you're, you're ready to like actually focus. It's not multi multitasking actually, they say works for like 4%. They say like maybe Elon Musk can multitask. Well, some of the hyper genius people can maybe do that, but it's very, very rare. So um, set up your workspace for success. And I know right now is very hard because we are sharing our workspaces with families and friends, roommates, um, I'm sharing my house with my husband every day for the past seven weeks. Um, but even if you don't have um, a dedicated workspace, um, you have a special pen or have a special notebook that's just dedicated to studying, to work, to um, personal, um, and switch that up. Um, they say that your brain actually needs to have something that identifies um, with the activity that you're going to do. So that's tip number two. Again, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box and we can go through it after. Tip number three is, um, this is really, typically when I work with clients, um, they come to me and they say, oh my goodness, I have this big project that needs to be done in one week. And most of the time, it's a project that they, they are putting on themselves. And it's a project too big to actually be done in a week. So um, our brain gets kind of overwhelmed with our goals and our projects. And so the best thing, and you, you learn this at Gonzaga as well, but sometimes you forget as an adult <laughs> afterwards, um, is to chunk things down. So you have your big goal. So sometimes people come to me with life changing goals. They want to change their career. They want to, they want to have a life that they don't have currently. Well, that takes time. So going kind of from the top of what the vision of what you need and want, and then going down and making that into goals and into strategies and then into, into little actions after that. But the heart of it really has to come with what your values are and what you really want as an individual and to, to reconnect with that. Um, then once you have your daily actions, prioritizing, of course, you know how to prioritize your Gonzaga students and faculty, but it doesn't help, um, it doesn't hurt to remind that writing down reasonable um, priorities every day. So your top three every day, and maybe that's even too much. Sometimes I tell clients, write down your top priority for the day, chunk that, and then you'll feel better at the end of the day because you feel like you've accomplished something. 
as opposed to having this long laundry list of to do's and going through the end of the day feeling a little tired because you feel like you, you didn't set reasonable goals for yourself. Then tip number four, we just have two left, and then we go to Q&A. Um, bringing certainty to your time schedule. So um, there's a little method called the Pomodoro method that I personally like. It's doing one activity. So let's say you break down your, your projects into little chunks and then into actions. So doing one action for 20 minutes straight, uninterrupted, and then taking a little stretch break, five minutes, going back, take, doing another 20 minutes, another little stretch break. And basically you work for 90 minute increments. It's just really trying to focus as opposed to multitasking, as opposed to being on your computer, ta talking on the phone, doing social media it's really not an efficient way to work. So um, this is another just little tip that I can give you. And last, but certainly not least, especially during this time, um, if you're, communicate, communicate to the people that are important to you. Um, it could be your, your family, your roommate, your partner, um, your, your colleague. Um, Maybe find one person that you feel like you want to connect during this time and create a cadence. Maybe every Monday you want to talk to this person and, 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 and share this. Make things that are implicit to make them more explicit. They say that um, we have so many neurons in the brain that it's impossible that two brains are, are alike. So in order to, to really share with someone, you have to make things very explicit to make sure that people understand. So um, setting a cadence to communicate regularly to the people that are important to you is super important. And with a final note, I think my internet's actually unstable, it says, but I can't control that. Um, but I wish you all a um, really healthy and happy time right now um, with your families and with your health. And now I'm up for any questions ah, about me as well. I studied at Gonzaga in 96, and since then I've had over 20 years of um, tech experience, started with Amazon, actually started with a job um, right out of the career center with an insurance company called Unum Insurance, had a wonderful job five days after graduation. And then from there went to a little bookstore called Amazon and started a wonderful um, career in retail marketing. From there went um, and worked for Macy's as a buyer in New York, and just many years of um, retail experience, then with Microsoft for 10 years, which then brought me to my dream job to come to France. And I've been in a coaching capacity for the past three years, and I founded my own coaching company last year, working with people in Europe and also in the US. So any questions now is task. Hi, uh, Antonelle, that was just wonderful. And uh, there are some questions in the chat. I've really been great. sort of forwarding some to you. Fantastic. So shall I read them, Molly, and go through there? Yeah, that would be great. So the first one was from you, Molly, saying, yes, scheduling adds certainty. Um, so did you want to rephrase that question? What is Actually, that was when you asked if we had ways of creating certainty. You asked us mm -hmm. to put them in the chat, but I wasn't totally 
secure that scheduling would be one of the tips, but then you covered it actually as a, as one of the tips. So yes, I think it does, especially, um, especially when the whole day is, is just wide open. Um, there's a great book, um, called Finding Flow. Um, I don't know if you know of this book, but the, um, scientist that wrote this book um, was talking about how sometimes when we don't have an objective for the day, like even the weekend sometimes, um, can be depressing for certain people because we don't know what the goal is. So, um, so putting some structure to your day, it doesn't mean that we have to schedule uh, business meetings. Maybe you just need to schedule an hour um, going out um, not even going out, but going, doing a yoga class or something in, in your, in front of your TV, Wh whatever you can do to provide a little bit more um, structure to your day and having a goal to it um, can really help provide certainty, especially during this time. Does that answer? That does question? definitely answer my question. And then the next question I sent you was from a student wondering if you could talk about the reward of finals week, if you're going to move away from the stress and toward the reward, what does that look like? Ah, mm, well, if I had to respond to her own question, um, his or her own question, um, I guess that person would have to tell me what the reward would be. So I could imagine that maybe the reward would be, um, you know, be, being done with this, this year, having a good grade, having a good, you know, imagining whatever that um, future career will be, having a sense of accomplishment. So it's for that person who asked the question to reflect on why, why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this. I decided to take this class because I'm doing this major because I decided I wanted to do this. Or maybe I just want to be proud of myself. So I don't know. There's so many answers to that question, but it's only that person that can really answer it. <laughs> but I, I like that universal question you just gave us. Why am I doing this? Remember mm. the, the objective um, in the middle of the stress. Okay, and then you have um, a couple of others there from Tyler and Lada. Great, let's see here. <laughs> So I have, oh yeah, my speaker's voice was, my, my, my um, connection here is not that great, unfortunately. Um, during this time, do you think people can spend too much time trying to communicate with others if they are constantly on the phone? Yes. In fact, um, there's a lot of studies about that right now too, um, that in fact, we're getting uh, almost um, Zoom fatigue, if you can call it that, or, um, it's exhausting because you want to be communicating with everyone. You want to be communicating with your friends, your family, your, um, and it's a, it's, it's a different rhythm. So it's for each person to find what rhythm needs to work for them. Um, for me personally, I take um, some days just to detox from digital, from social media, from talking to friends. Um, not because I don't want to be connected, but because you can actually burn out if you don't find your own balance. So in this situation, you have to try to find the balance that works for you and not ignore those emotions. Um, but when I did say communicating, um, what you could do is maybe try to determine one person that you can and if you want, I mean, it, it just depends on the person, but maybe you determine one one person, like for me, um, for my coaching practice, I determined to find one um, coach to connect with every week. And that makes me feel less alone um, in this profession from working alone. Um, and it really, it really ma it makes a difference it's to find one person that you trust. I hope that answers your question. Um, now, this is from Tyler. Thanks for your presentation. I've been reflecting on the piece about how we tend to avoid threat before moving towards reward. I'm a person that tends to rationalize very quickly what threat means to me, and in turn move toward reward and joy more than I work toward. Often focus on the negative and dwell on moving from threat 
rather than moving towards reward and joy. What are some tips you have for encouraging others to begin searching for reward and not becoming overwhelmed or too focused on issues that may or may not even affect you? Um, hmm. Well, the first lesson is we can't change other people. <laughs> Sometimes that's hard because we want to change, especially the people we love, we want to change. But we have to also have peace that sometimes we can't change. But to influence, um, you could maybe, um, you could help the person understand the reward um, of going towards more um, the positive. So in neuroscience, which what I like about neuroscience is it's actually science. So. start to think more positively and you go towards the war reward, more neuro, ah, my internet's unstable again. Can you hear me? Okay. So more neurons are created in an exponential fashion and it creates dopamine and serotonin, all this positive um, emotion, uh, all these positive chemicals that help you in turn um, create new habits in that positive loop. So what I would recommend maybe is to try to explain that concept to your to your family and friends that may um, not understand the benefit of thinking positively and maybe invest in a few books that could help enlighten them. But also be at peace that you can't change everyone and you could only be a leader yourself and hopefully people will, will decide that they like your lifestyle. Thank you. <laughs> Hope that helps. It does, thank you very much. Yeah, you guys are welcome to speak too, because I feel like I'm just speaking to myself, <laughs> except for Molly. Uh, oh, Molly asked me, oh, privately, but that's okay. Did you study abroad while at, Gon at Gonzaga? Yes, I studied in Florence uh, my junior year, and that was an excellent, excellent opportunity. In fact, um, so I'm Italian. No, I'm sure it's not a, um, a secret with my name. Uh, my parents are from Italy, so I'm just first generation always had this dream to move to Europe. Um, and I wanted to, right after Gonzaga, I bought a ticket, I packed my bags, everything. Um, but then um, some unforeseen um, circumstances happened with my family, so I couldn't go. But many years later, um, I had the opportunity with Microsoft. Um, and I said, well, I don't speak French. Um, no problem, I don't know, for some reason it just, Sometimes you visualize something and it actually happens. <laughs> and um, so at age 37, I packed my bags, went to France, didn't speak a word of French. And um, here I am eight years later um, with my own business and married, happily married. Um, yeah, that was my, uh, I wondered if you did a French <laughs> um. No, 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 I was in Italy. In fact, um, no, I... Living in Italy would have been my dream originally, but the opportunity to come to France was um, was presented to me, and I'm really happy here. And I go to Italy very often. <laughs> um, I also sent you a question about the Pomodoro technique, ah, um, which yeah. I'm a big fan of. And, um, well, actually, Lada had a question as well. I don't want to take away from no, great. Ask, but could you say a little bit more like about that technique and why you find it helpful? Sure. Um, so I, so the technique itself, in case, um, in case you don't know of it, you can look it up on, people can look it up online, but um, Molly's familiar with it. So it really helps you focus. So um, you do, your to-do list. So you have this big vision of what you want to do, but you chunk it down into little segments. And then you really schedule on your calendar 20 minutes of focus time. And you say, I'm going to do this one thing. And I like it because it just really helps me um, just get through things in a, in a very organized fashion. Um, it just, it's efficient. And so 20 minutes, and then you give yourself the reward of a little break. 
and then you put your little timer and you have to be careful with the timer too because if you use your you use your phone but put it on airplane or or if, if you have like one of those old fashioned timers the pomodoro that's why it's called the pomodoro method um do that but i just use my phone and i put it on airplane and honestly i don't always get through the 90 minutes sometimes i just do um 40 minutes which or i'm sorry um 40 25 so i five minute break, 25 minutes, and five minute break. That's what it is. Um, and I tell clients that, cause sometimes they say, okay, I wanna do 90 minutes, but I can't. So just start small with the 25 minutes and then work up to the, the full hour. And then if you can, you work up to the 90 minute. Um, so you guys can just look that up online. And I think it's quite effective. But the one thing is, is to try to make sure you're clear on what you wanna do during each segment, I think. Molly, did you have some other um, tips on the Pomodoro method since you're such a fan? Um, thanks for asking. Yes, I, I like it because it's a rule that you can't do anything else during that 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these ideas pop into my head. Oh, I should check on this. I should check on mm -hmm. that. And you just make a note, you know, that when the 20 minutes are up, you can go check on those other things or, or exactly. ask you to do this. Mm -hmm. well, and yeah. Go ahead. During these times when sometimes I'll start a task and because of the um, online nature of the work, an hour or two will pass and I'll think, how have I been working on this for so long? Mm -hmm. Pomodoro really makes you focus on the chunks of time and you know how much time you're spending. So I find that very helpful. Me too. And I think if you were going to go even further, um, um, there's a tech, I learned from neuroscience that you, you can track your ultradian rhythm. So when you go to sleep, there's a circadian rhythm of uh, 90 minutes of sleep followed by the REM, um, 20 minutes. So in the daytime, it's the opposite. So you have 90 minutes of time that you're the most productive and then um, followed by 20 minutes of rest. So that's the concept of the 90 minutes of total um, the total maximum of Pomodoro to take the 20 minute break. So you could actually track to see when you feel like you're the most efficient during the day and try to um, do like your most high level work during that 90 minute segment. But I could send you some information about that then, Molly, and you can send it to the, the students if you want. <laughs> that would be great. I hadn't heard that about the, how Pomodoro sort of came to be. Hmm. So. You have another question from Lada Kirpis about, um, I'll just read it. It, yeah, was shown, sure. it was shown that some cultures are polychronic, mm -hmm. multitask, work on multiple tasks in a nonlinear progression, while other cultures are monochronic, primarily yeah. Western, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic cultures focus on one thing at a time. How does advice to focus on one thing at a time apply in multicultural work study environment? Mm -hmm. Does it apply to people who are better by not focusing on one thing at a time? Uh, to be honest, um, I have not heard that, uh, that certain cultures are, are more wired to multitask than others. Um, I hadn't heard that. So I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, from what I have studied, a um, very small percentage of the population are really, even though maybe it's a habit to multi multitask, um, the prefrontal cortex can only handle a couple topics at one time. So David Rock is a great one to read. Um, he has a couple books on this about, and he calls, you know, the, the, the stage, like basically all these ideas are trying to come up to the stage like as if in a play so but you can only have a couple actors on the stage at one time so he makes that metaphor to the with the brain so i guess um as far as i know all brains are alike in that way but i'm not sure it's a good question 
Well, um, to maybe clarify this, um, uh, I'm less maybe familiar with the neuroscience, this is Lada Kurfi speaking, uh, but you know, I'm naturally interested in uh, this topic by virtue of uh, teaching in you know, the relevant classes such as international marketing and through my own research. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's just kind of a fascinating topic, but um, you know, this notion comes from the research of Edward Hall, who is an anthropologist. So it's basically from kind of this background. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, the, um, you know, the notion of polychronic might be a little bit misleading. It doesn't mean that a person is kind of scatterbrained and working on, you know, three things sim simultaneously. It's more like work on the projects goes in a non-linear, less planned sort of fashion. So mm. a person might be refocusing from, um, you know, say uh, in a monochronic culture, you have, um, you know, somebody working on projects A, B, and C, and it will be a person mm -hmm. is focusing on A, and then finishes, goes to B, then goes to C, while in a polychronic, you're more likely to see a person working on something, you know, of project A, jump into project B, then, you know, reconnecting with, you know, a family member, because those cultures tend to be more relationship oriented, like mm. Latin American cultures, you know, actually Mediterranean cultures are more, mm. since you are, you know, from Italy, and mm. kind of friends are more like this, because it's so important to them, then they jump back to project A, then maybe to project C, then B. It looks chaotic but it's uh it's actually how those you know cultures were you know function sort of in the more in a normal way and this is why it's just kind of it, it just fascinates me how universal are the you know recommendations of the uh, you know so 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 to say organization organizational culture or you know whether it needs to be amended for some cultural differences it's a really good question um and it's true um my first reaction when I moved to France was, um, was actually my, the way I work in the United States do, did not 100% work here in France because it's all about relationships and it's about, it is, it's a little bit more like a dance in a way. Um, but from the neuroscience perspective, I don't know, I'm going to have to, what was the name of the man, Edward? Edward Hall, yeah, I mean, and it's basically uh, dated, but classic science. He was first published in Harvard Business Review in 1960s. I'll be happy to send uh, a link to... Okay, uh, I'll check the, it out. Uh, silent uh, languages of culture. And I mean, it is still being taught in business schools because, I mean, that's in the MBA programs. This is how mm -hmm. classic it is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think... I don't know. I'll have to. I'll have to read it. But go ahead and read um, David Rock's Brain at Work, and you can and you can check it out on your own and see what you think. Um, uh -huh. David Rock. Uh -huh. I think um, in general, I think it's this notion of letting this limbic system take over to the prefrontal cortex. So as much as we can is to remove remove the noise, but from a social perspective when a culture is is already habitually used to a different type of communication um, that works for that culture but but I, I I don't know I'm not an expert as far as that um, mm -hmm. that subject so thank you for the question thank you so much uh, so much for the answer and for the reference of course um, uh, where can we learn more about the Pomodoro method um, literally just um, type it in to the computer, to Google, um, and you can find it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, did, you guys, did, did you have any um, suggestions that you have um, as far as how to create certainty during this time? So I talked more about work certainty, um, but it could be, it could be just, just about anything, anything that you need to create certainty in your own world. Um, just try to try to reflect on that. On um, um, if you have any other suggestions, I'd be happy to hear about it. And Molly, you were saying? Oh, I was just going to say the tips that you gave us are just so helpful. I wish I'd written them down as we went. Um, I, I can go back and watch the video. So <laughs> <laughs> I could send this to you as well, Molly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That would be that would be very helpful. So 
Any last questions before we um, end this presentation portion of Mondays at noon and, and stay on the line with the Dean and um, see if there are any questions. Just saw a message from Mary Heitkemper that virtual happy hours are great and coffee virtual dates are nice mm -hmm. too. Something I see happening around Spokane is people uh, driving to parking lots and sitting in the back of their cars or sitting on the back of their cars if they don't have hatchbacks and, and sort of having these social distant happy hours. Um, it's true. I don't know if that works in Paris. Mm, definitely, no. And um, I can't remember who brought up, sometimes we have to be also aware of what, what cadence works for us, like maybe if we're not connecting enough or if we're not, if we're connecting too much. Um, I think the last thing that I didn't bring up is the balance of it all because to have a healthy mind, it's almost like having a healthy, healthy plate, you know, that's it. like you have to have your vegetables, your a little bit of everything um, on your plate. So make sure you take time to um, play and to have downtime to connect all these things um, are really important to have a balance. It's just a different cadence right now and it's kind of difficult. I think that's a great place to, to stop and think about healthy, healthy balance. So thank you so much for being here and I will follow up and send out the, the slides and so forth to the students. And of course, this will be on the YouTube channel so others can watch it. Appreciate you Best so much. Best of luck with fine. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye.